A new theory is emerging explaining the modern obesity epidemic. In today's show, we're going to talk about the fructose survival hypothesis and draw upon the work from Richard Johnson over at University of Colorado. I think this phenomenon is incredibly interesting. In short, and we'll talk about the details, the fructose survival hypothesis highlights an evolutionarily adaptive mechanism that gets exploited in modern society where we have ample access to hyperpalatable, ultra-processed junk food. Now, this ancient survival switch known as the fructose hypothesis proposes that obesity and metabolic disorders may have developed from an overstimulation of this evolutionarily-based biologic response that aims to protect animals in advance of crisis, such as a food shortage. Now, it helps when there's no water, no food for this survival switch that we're going to talk about to kick in to help animals make water from fat and utilize these different mechanisms. But again, in this hyperpalatable, ultra-processed food environment, this is where we start to see the fructose survival switch convert into obesity and all the associated diseases like accelerated aging, uh, we have diabetes, we have dementia, uh, we have all these complications, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and much more. So here's what happens. This response is characterized by hunger, thirst, foraging, weight gain, fat accumulation, insulin resistance, systemic inflammation, as well as increased blood pressure. The process is initiated by the ingestion of fructose or by stimulating endogenous fructose production via the polyol pathway from sugar, which we're gonna talk about very, very soon. Unlike other nutrients, fructose reduces the active energy, adenosine triphosphate or ATP within your cells and pivots your cells away from making aerobically making energy into favoring glycolysis. And we've seen this metabolic switching occur in overweight and obesity. We call this as a Warburg effect or being metabolically inflexible. But this is important to understand that, that fructose initiates this same mechanistic switch that causes a low energy environment, stimulating all the negative downstream pathways such as NAD depletion and much more. And so this is mediated in part by uric acid accumulation, mitochondrial oxidative stress, and the inhibition of AMP kinase and overstimulation of vasopressin, which I think is incredibly fascinating. So again, Richard Johnson has presented this work at Low Carb Denver. I actually attended that last year and heard him talk about this, which was incredibly fascinating. Uh, another paper that we're going to talk about is the fructose survival hypothesis as a mechanism for unifying the various obesity hypotheses. And again, these two papers I will put in the show notes. I think you will find these to be incredibly insightful and fascinating. Now, before we continue on, friends, I just want to say thank you for being here. If you're enjoying the content, hit that like button and leave me a comment in the comment section below. We're going to share a lot of fascinating images and talk about the details here and why table sugar, known as sucrose, contains both fructose as well as glucose and how this can be problematic because it turns out that excessive glucose can be converted into fructose and stimulate all of these negative pathways, which is important because many of you are already not having high fructose corn syrup in your diet. You're not having sugar-sweetened beverages, but if you're eating a diet enriched in carbohydrates, particularly ultra-processed carbohydrates, you can be converting that glucose into fructose and causing all these problems. And it turns out you can test for this, which is important. So since we're talking about metabolic health, I just want to remind you of the novel berberine fasting accelerator by Myoscience. What makes this formula unique is it helps to prevent those cravings for hyperpalatable junk food in the evenings. It increases ketones. It can help support metabolic health as well. It turns out that some of the mechanisms by which berberine exerts its health benefits help to reverse some of these changes from fructose as well. So you can save using the code podcast over at myoscience.com. Again, that's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. I will put links in the description below. So let's talk more about this hypothesis and what are the mechanisms, mechanistically speaking, how does fructose drive obesity, insulin resistance, systemic inflammation, or raise uric acid? Well, you have to go back to some of Richard Johnson's work in animals. And what he found is that when you knock out the key enzyme that helps metabolize fructose, known as fructokinase, in the liver, you, you see these animals will consume large amounts of fructose, but they don't experience the metabolic sequela or downstream complications from that. So it turns out that this enzyme in the liver is key in initiating some of the deleterious effects of high glucose or fructose consumption. And so again, this enzyme is fructokinase. As you can see from these images, this enzyme utilizes ATP. And so it starts to burn up your cellular ATP within the mitochondria in your liver, possibly your muscles as well. And that starts to cause all these downstream effects, decreasing cellular energy production and ultimately affecting leptin signaling. So we've talked a lot about leptin before. 
We know that leptin is a pleiotropic adipocytokine. What that means is leptin does many different things. It's released from your fat tissue. When you're in a state of low energy, when you're fasted, uh, low leptin levels will signal your hypothalamus within your brain to start inducing food-seeking behavior. So you start to, to look for food. You're going through your pantry. You're, you're looking for cookies. You're looking for crackers. You're looking for bread, looking for cheese, whatever high-calorie foods you can be uh, searching for. Well, it turns out that in overweight individuals, they have high levels of leptin, and that causes them to search out for food, even though they have a lot of excess energy in their body fat stores. And so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So this hyperphagia is a phenomenon that we see in obesity. And it turns out that there's many different mechanisms by which excess fructose and glucose consumption drive hyperleptinemia. And that causes this food-seeking behavior and consumption of hyperpalatable junk foods, even though there's enough energy stored. Uh, people with obesity and morbid obesity could go an entire year without eating any food. In fact, the longest uh, individual that has ever been documented to fast, I think it was like 390 some odd days. This was a, a, a gentleman in the UK. He went without food for over a year. Uh, and so people can do this because body fat can be broken down to provide cellular energy for maintaining homeostatic functions within the body. But if you have a lot of glucose and fructose on board, that will uh, tweak these different metabolic pathways and induce this, this food-seeking behavior, which again would be evolutionarily adaptive in a, a state of a famine, right? Where you need to get very creative to find food sources and you're constantly searching and looking for food in that sort of environment. But excess fructose doesn't really help us in this environment, but it would help us in the fall when fructose from fruit, remember, the, the name of fructose is derived from fruit sugar. So when you have apples, you have berries, you have these things that are seasonally available in the fall to increase body fat storage to enhance your chances of surviving a very cold, long winter, right? It makes sense that this fruit would cause us to be leptin resistant. So we're really searching for food and looking out for food. But in this environment where we really don't have food scarcity issues, we don't have food shortage issues, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So this is why we really should be minimizing our consumption, particularly of glucose and fructose containing foods. This pathways you can see from these images also disrupt aging pathways by depleting your NAD. And you might be saying, well, Mike, I don't eat fructose. I know that sugar-sweetened beverages are bad. I know that high fructose corn syrup is problematic. So I am not at risk for developing all these downstream deleterious metabolic health complications that are linked with elevated rates of fructose, particularly uh, in the liver. Well, it turns out that via a pathway known as the polyol pathway, Table sugar, which is one part fructose, one part glucose, uh, can actually be converted into fructose. So this polyol pathway can be upregulated when you have high levels of blood sugar. And so we see this in diabetics and insulin-resistant diabetics. You know, these people are constantly consuming energy and feel like they're, they're, they're thirsty all the time. They have issues uh, with, with thirst regulation. And it turns out there's a, a link with sodium we're going to talk about uh, very, very soon. So uh, salty foods can trigger this. This is probably why French fries are among, as well as probably, probably pizza, among the unhealthiest food because they contain both high calories from fat and sugar uh, and carbohydrates. And these can uh, augment these different pathways. So Again, to summarize, glucose can be converted into fructose in the body, and this has been shown in diabetics and, and uh, obese individuals. They have higher levels of, bl of blood fructose as well as uric acid. So just because you don't eat fructose doesn't mean you're exempt from the problems of fructose metabolism if you're eating a lot of processed food or foods derived or con sugar-containing foods because uh, sugar can be ripped through this polyol pathway, creating fructose, which can lead to all of the changes that are unfavorable that we mentioned, decreasing mitochondrial ATP, decreasing NAD function, increasing oxidative stress, increasing leptin resistance, and food-seeking behavior, and all of the inflammatory issues that are linked therein. So Richard Johnson et al. say, while this response is aimed to be modest and short-lived, the response in humans is exaggerated due to the thrifty genes coupled with a Western diet rich in foods that contain or generate fructose. We propose excessive fructose metabolism not only expends obesity, but the epidemics of diabetes, hypertension, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, ob obesity-associated cancers, vascular and Alzheimer's dementia, and even aging. Moreover, this hypothesis unites current hypotheses on obesity, reducing activation and or blocking this pathway and stimulating mitochondrial regeneration may benefit health and lifespan. 
So incredibly fascinating stuff. And you might be saying, well, how could I test for this? Are there any biomarkers that I might want to look for? Well, uh, uric acid elevations could be a potential biomarker to consider, as well as elevations in liver enzymes. We've talked about these at length in other videos. The AST, ALT, and G2T are the three liver function tests that can give you an idea about the fat buildup within your liver, which is one of the secondary factors that you will see after excessive triglyceride elevations. And so that's another thing to consider. We talked about in another video, the triglyceride to glucose index as a marker of cardiovascular disease-related mortality, as well as insulin resistance. And so a simple way to figure out this biomarker is to, to just convert your triglycerides and glucose into milligrams per deciliter. You uh, multiply those together and divide that by two, and ideally that would be under 4,000 or four, which I think is really helpful for people to understand. And we would start to see these changes in triglycerides as well as glucose if someone is consuming a diet high in fructose and or glucose. And so what I think is really interesting about this is Richard Johnson and his team are doing a lot of mechanistic studies to help further elucidate why we're seeing such an increase in obesity and diabetes and that, are, that is not really explained just by calories. And so they've done several different studies in their labs, uh, in their lab finding, at least in animals, that when the uh, liver uh, fructokinase is knocked out, even giving uh, these animals diets high in carbohydrates and fructose, it doesn't worsen the obesity-associated problems. And so it appears that obviously calories do matter, but even if you're in a low calorie, eating a low calorie diet, if you're getting a lot of glucose and or fructose from that, that could be worsening your odds of further developing uh, diabetes and fatty liver disease and much more. So hopefully you found these images helpful and I would definitely encourage you to check out uh, these clips from Richard Johnson over at Low Carb Denver from 2023. Fascinating discussion. Again, to test to see if you might be at risk for uh, the sequela linked with fructose consumption. We talked about uric acid, triglycerides, liver function tests, as well as glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and more. Now, it's worth mentioning that high carb diets paired with high salt diets could be problematic. It, it appears that sodium plays a role here. And mechanistically, we don't really know, or uh, it hasn't been fully elucidated in the literature. But this is why uh, I think it's problematic to have a, a, a diet high in carbohydrates as well as high salt. And so you start to see the increased risk of diabetes in people who are eating high carb and high salt diets. And this uh, sodium dependent pathway may trigger somehow xanthine oxidase and uric acid and all these problems. So again, if you're eating a lot of sodium, you probably want to cut back on your carbohydrate consumption. I think is uh, the take home message there. More on that to come. What are your thoughts? I think this is incredibly interesting and fascinating. I would love to know what you think in the comments section below. As always, I'm grateful that you tuned all the way in. If you did enjoy this video, please hit that like button, share this with a friend, and we'll catch you on a future show down the road.